Hey everybody, my name is Shane Wiegand. I'm on the board of the Beachwood Neighborhood Coalition, and I'm going to be talking to you about exploring and owning our history in Beachwood. Um, the reason I'm not here is because I had to fly on a plane, which I'm on probably right now as you're watching this, uh, to go be the best man and my best friend from college and my college roommate Paul's wedding. Unfortunately, that wedding is in Albuquerque, and I got the dates wrong and realized I'm flying out tonight. So that's why I made this video to kind of give you a little history about Beachwood that some of you might not know about and some might. Um, why am I talking to you about this? Well, in part because I do a whole lecture series on the history of housing in Rochester. You can see me in the picture there giving a talk um, at Spiritus Christi Church the other week. Um, but I've been giving over 40 different talks the last year or two um, about this history in Rochester. I'm also the outreach chair for the City Roots Community Land Trust. And this presentation has been in part a lot of the work that we've been doing here in Beechwood. So I want to start by talking about our Rochester. This is our community that we love. We're the home of Frederick Douglass, the home of Susan B. Anthony, the home of George Eastman, a great innovator. We're the home of the Tasty French Brothers and their mustard. And we're also the home of a professional baseball field right here in Beechwood called the Baseball Park. Baseball Park at Bay Street from 1908 to 1928. Babe Ruth actually played here, and he was one of the only players to ever hit a ball over the big right field fence during a barnstorming appearance in 1921. Today, the streets of Netherton, McKinster, Iroquois, and Greeley are along where this baseball field used to be. And we're going to talk about how those houses got to be there in a little bit. Um, we also have the Webster Park rink, which was right by the baseball field. Uh, you can see the Sable Brothers zipping along in their ice hockey tournament or uh, speed skating. You can see 99-year-old Jack McCabe right here uh, cutting his skates right at the Webster Park rink and some kids just having a blast as well. What a cool part of our neighborhood as well as the Wegmans that we used to have on Bay and Culver. You can see uh, manager Dick Crusby giving out a thousand dollar reward to a Beechwood neighbor who I guess won a big prize. We also are a neighborhood uh, that just loves kids and uh, like the Freedom School, the incredible learning that the kids in our neighborhood do there that our community is bringing to them. The Ryan Center where we're meeting now that hundreds of kids play in every day um, and check out books and play basketball and make great connections that Louise Slaughter helped us make sure was built. Our Rochester is also was recently voted the 14th best place for quality of life. And again, that's quality of life for some people, but an important distinction. But we also know that Beechwood and Rochester have another side of quite a bit of poverty and segregation. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that has played out in the Beechwood neighborhood. But before we do that, I want to recognize that sometimes this can be an uncomfortable and difficult subject for some of us. But in order for our neighborhood to continue to grow and to be better and to improve, we have to understand where we've come from and where we're going. Um, James Baldwin wrote this incredible quote. He said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So please join me as we talk about how de jour segregation and racism in Rochester, and specifically in Beechwood, happened with the real estate industry redlining, the VA and FHA and the backed mortgages they backed, and restrictive covenants. This is Howard Coles. He was one of the pioneers of housing activism in the city of Rochester for people of color. In 1938, he helped conduct a survey or a big report of housing across the city and found that there are numerous apartments and houses which people of color cannot rent because certain big real estate agencies set the example of refusing to rent to Negroes, and this included in the Beechwood neighborhood. <clears throat> this is the Reverend Charles Bodie. <clears throat> excuse me, in 1946, saying, The housing situation has always been an enigma to the Negro. In Rochester, only two areas have been gracefully made available for him. If any attempt is made to move out of the black ghetto, the attempt is met with opposition. And this includes the Beechwood neighborhood. Now, part of how this was established was through the National Association of Real Estate Boards, of which most Rochester real estate agents were a part of. And in their code of ethics, it essentially told real estate agents, don't sell houses in white neighborhoods like Beechwood to black home buyers. 
For more than 30 years, the code specifically read that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood the character of property or occupancy members of any race or nationality or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. Here we see Frank Drum, the president of the Rochester Real Estate Board chapter, and one of the laws he was, one of the code of ethics pieces he was enforcing with real estate agents here in Rochester also included this statement, that real estate agents were advised not to sell to a colored man of means who is giving his children a college education. We'll learn more about Frank Drum in a little bit. Dr. Walter Cooper, a famed scientist from Kodak and uh, New York State Regent, um, he described coming to Rochester in 1954 and answering ads for 69 apartments and being refused at all of them all across the city of Rochester. During the same period of time, we've got the Great Depression. We have a significant housing crisis. Both white and black had trouble finding housing. So FDR and the Congress and Senate, they, they passed several pieces of legislation that helped f put over $120 billion into building new homes for people. They did this to help restart the economy after the Depression, help soldiers after coming back from World War II, by houses. The FHA and the VA help banks give out millions of dollars of mortgages to white people and finance massive suburban tract housing and tract housing in the city, which we're going to talk about in Beechwood. Written right into the law in the FHA's underwriting manual, it says right here that they want to make sure that locations where new homes are being built aren't invaded by such groups. They're talking about people of color. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. And the racist idea behind that is explained here. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. This is Rochester's residential security map. The way that uh, they wanted to enforce uh, this law is they created these maps. Some people call these redlining maps, but they're really called residential security maps. We'll zoom in on Beechwood, but Beechwood is right here in red, as well as over here in yellow. Here's Buffalo's residential security map, Syracuse's, Albany's, New York City, and these maps were made for almost every city in the entire United States. So the government creates the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, which went and surveyed or raided neighborhoods in several northern cities, including Rochester, and that's our map right there. You can go online and look at each neighborhood, and we're going to do that with Beechwood. Areas shaded red and yellow indicated that the government was less likely to back mortgages because those areas were potentially dangerous, polluted, or had residents of color already living there. Here's a Hulk Recessor's report on Corn Hill neighborhood. You can see right on the sh shift there's a spot for how many foreign families live there, what nationalities, how many Negroes live in a neighborhood. Here in Corn Hill, 75% of the neighborhood was Negro. In the Corn Hill neighborhood, or was for people of color, um, the term they used at the time was Negro, 75% in that area. And that was the third ward. The third and seventh wards was where real estate agents were steering people of color um, before these redlining maps were made. And that was why this area right here was redlined. Here's Beechwood's red line neighborhood. You can see where Goodman Street is. You can see Diamond Place, Copeland, Allison. Um, right here is where we are at the Ryan Center, if you're looking at my mouse. Um, this is the actual assessor's report. You can see at this time in this redlined area, it was 2% Negro, um, and that there were 30% of that area were foreign families, and that the nationalities were Italian and mixed foreign that were also part of those foreign families is the way that they labeled it. They described this area as advancing in age and in a downward spiral and to be classed as distinctly hazardous. Um, they also described this part of Beechwood as unattractive. Here's the yellow lined part of Beechwood. Um, you can see Rosewood Terrace right next to School 33. You can see Netherton, McKinster, Varden, uh, Vermont, Greeley, Cedarwood, Kingston, Quincy, Sydney, there's Denver. Um, and you can see right here on the map that this part of the neighborhood was only 1% people of color, and 20% of the neighborhood were foreign families, uh, Italians. And you can see right here, infiltration. They're describing this part of the neighborhood as infiltrated by Italians 
who are gradually continuing to come in. And I zoomed right in on it there so you can see where it says infiltration. They're explicitly looking for neighborhoods um, that are at threat of no longer being white Protestant neighborhoods, which was Beechwood. But you can still see that Beechwood was 99% people who were white, only 1% Negro. And then in the redlined area, it was 2% people of color. Um, this is what they said about the yellow lined area, saying it used to be a nice residential city, part of the city, but age and obsolescence has set in. And you can go through and read more about that later. The FHA only backed mortgages for white people in blue and green parts of the city and for white people buying and building houses in the suburbs. Sometimes in yellow parts of the city, like Beechwood, you could still get an FHA mortgage if you were white, but it made it a little bit trickier. The FHA and VA insured half of all new mortgages nationwide during this 30-year period. The FHA and VA gave out over $120 billion in mortgage insurance. In all these cities, they had assessors like this guy, Alfred Gertis, who was the chief underwriter here in Rochester and helped build all kinds of housing, including housing in the baseball tract in Beechwood. You can see him here building a whites-only veterans housing complex in Brighton. He's driving a big bulldozer, smoking his pipe. Um, during this time, these policies were incredibly effective at increasing home ownership. From 1934, 44% of Americans owned homes to 63% of Americans owning homes in 1972. And largely this happened because of all this money and in mortgage insurance that got put in and financing for new track development to be built by builders and real estate agents. Also because this act created the 30-year fixed interest mortgage um, that so many of us have today in, in owning our homes. Over 35 million families nationwide benefited from these FHA and VA back loans, and 98% of them were white. Written right into the underwriting manual, um, especially for builders who are building tract housing, um, was a direction to add deed restrictions to be imposed upon all land in the immediate environment of the subject location. The recommended restriction in order to get federal financing said this, prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. Let's see how that played out in several places around Rochester. Here in Brighton, around 12 Corners, the Meadowbrook neighborhood, it's described as a carefully planned development. It was so carefully planned that Kodak, who built these homes with ESL and the Kodak Realty Corporation, every lot says this underneath it, no lot or dwelling shall be sold to or occupied by a colored person for all of the homes in that area. And that was written to the deed by the Kodak Employees Realty Corporation. Builders like Fred Hills and Frank Drum, which you remember from earlier in the presentation, they owned Alliance Realty, which built thousands and hundreds of homes across the Rochester area using FHA financing and FHA-backed mortgages. You can see them there celebrating their dividends. They were the largest realty corporation north of New York City during this period of time. Here are some properties Fred Hills and Alliance Realty built out on Bellmead, Thornton, and Windell Roads in Irondequoit. Underneath all of these dwellings, it read in the deed, the dwelling shall be occupied by persons of the Caucasian race only. So these are pictures that I took down at the county clerk's office, and you can go check them out um, right at this location at the clerk's office if you want to look at them more closely. Uh, Hills and then the builder Norman Huck uh, went out to Gates and they built 250 houses in over a, few, a short few years at, by Brookley Heights and on every single deed of these homes it said no lot shall ever be occupied by a colored person. Um, here in the Beechwood neighborhood at the Baseball Park track, Fred Tosh built the homes on McKinster, Parkside, Iroquois, Greeley, um, and they built these homes and underneath every single home where the baseball field used to be, they wrote into the deed, you can see where William Daly wrote this, this land is sold on the express covenant that it shall never be occupied by a colored person written under the deed for every one of these homes. Right here is Webster Park and where um, the Ryan Center is now. There's William Daly, um, who was the head real estate agent for this purchase for where these restrictive covenants are. These homes were sold for $9,000, and today many of these homes are going for upwards of ninety to over $100,000. Um, and it still remains the healthiest parts um, financially of the Beechwood neighborhood. 
The same thing with these restrictive covenants um, happened with every Levitt town that was built across the United States. Almost 8% of all suburban developments um, during the 40s and 30s were Levitt town construction. Um, and these homes all had restrictive covenants barring people of color from living in those homes. Um, Wallace Smith, um, who you, many of you know from our last meeting, you can see him here speaking at city council on behalf of FIGHT. He would walk by what is today the Freedom Market uh, most days on his way um, to sports practice uh, at School 33. And at this time, the neighborhood was almost entirely white. And he and his brothers, they'd have bricks, rocks, bottles thrown at them, and repeatedly called the N-word as they would walk down the street there. And Wallace can talk more if he's here at the meeting about what, what had happened with this. But during this time, Wallace wanted me to share this story of the Nikita brothers and the Nikita family who actually really looked out for him and his brothers as they walked down the street and would actually protect them um, from the people who were overtly racist as they would walk down to School 33. And they lived right where the Freedom Market is today. So it's pretty cool that Wallace works now in that same building where they lived. A really neat story in Beechwood. And we'd love to hear other stories that you all have here in Beechwood about our neighborhood that we don't want to forget so we can add them to our website. Now, in 1958, New York State Commission Against Discrimination issued a report that delved into Rochester and the sad state of housing right here. Governor Harriman initiated this report, which found that in 1950, 80% of people of color in Monroe County lived in the 3rd and 7th wards. No person of color in Monroe County was ever given an FHA or VA loan for any new suburban development. The ghettos contain 20% of all units with no private bathrooms and 30% of all units with no running water in those redlined areas of the city. People of color, one of the only choices they had for where they were allowed to live in the 50s and 40s were in these places like the Hanover houses built in 1952, seven seven-story public housing units where Tops is today on Clinton Avenue. But public housing was built for white people as well. Whites only housing was built in Fernwood, the Fernwood over Norton Village right near Beechwood, Cobbs Hill, the Seth Green apartments. Those were all veterans, whites only apartments. Howard Coles had several black veterans who were married with children apply for these apartments and all of them were denied. The man on the left right here, Elmer Milliman, is standing next to Mayor Dicker at Fernwood as their breaking ground. Elmer Milliman, you can go to the RMC archives and see Howard Cole's writings, and you can see his responses to the black veterans telling them that they did not qualify to live um, in these apartments. They made a big deal out of it in the paper, and still people of color were denied from living in these whites-only housing projects in the city. Segregation in Rochester today, Ed Doherty says, um, was created by these strong attitudes and policies that I just described. They created the racial and ethnic segregation we saw then and that we still see today. When you look at the baseball, Paul, baseball track today, it's between 30 and 40 percent uh, people of color living there. You can also notice how Vermont and McKinley streets also have a much lower concentration of people of color. Whereas if you look at the rest of the Beechwood neighborhood, you can really kind of see the line where over here is our whiter part of the neighborhood and over here is a much higher concentration of people of color, upwards of 50 to 70 to 80 percent. You can see North Winton Village over here is a much whiter neighborhood and East Avenue over here is much whiter. Another way to look at it, this map shows each part of the, of the neighborhood uh, where people of white, white people live and you can see the darker purple um, in this part of the neighborhood is still where most white people are living in Beechwood. And on this part and over here where the redlined area is still majority African American part of our neighborhood today. Citywide, you can see that owner occupied homes are way lower in these red and yellow line neighborhoods. Um, so hopefully, We've explored a little bit and we're owning a little bit Beechwood's history when it comes to the real estate industry, redlining, the VA and FHA backed mortgages, and restrictive covenants. But what stories are left to be told? So now Kyle and Joe and Dr. Oberg, well, they're going to ask you to share a little bit. What other stories like the story of Wallace and the Nikitas um, and the stories like restrictive covenants at the baseball field, both good and bad stories, still need to be told about our neighborhood in Beechwood? We're going to try to put all these stories on our Beechwood website under our new history section. You can email me your ideas at shanewegan22 at gmail.com. I can't wait to see you all next month and hear about the great things that you decide to include. Thank you so much for listening.